I'm just going to do a very, very quick review of George Washington and John Adams' presidencies. And remember, for the AP exam, they're not going to be asking you questions like, you know, uh, when did George Washington as general cross the, you know, the Delaware to attack at Trenton? They're not going to be asking questions like that. Remember, the AP exam focuses mostly on society, uh, social change, economics, things like that. And very, very rarely are you going to see stuff about military or anything like that on there. Um, so focus on social changes, social justice, uh, you know, economic reform, technology growth, uh, big social movements, civil rights, things like that. Um, major laws, uh, how things change for, for, for uh, the average person and culture and things like that. But here's George Washington as president. Uh, uh, Judiciary Act of 1789 helps establish uh, uh, you know, the third branch. You know, you got the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branch. And uh, the Court of Appeals, and they kind of designed it to not step on the toes of the states. Remember, it's a very, very contentious time period um, back then about uh, where the ultimate power should and will lie. And, and uh, remember, the U.S. Constitution, uh, not everyone agreed on its interpretation back then. And still today, we don't agree on its interpretation. Um, another thing that George Washington does as uh, president, with the advice of his, uh, one of his closest advisors, Alexander Hamilton, he creates an excise tax, a tax on whiskey. Um, and, uh, you know, Hamilton says, you know, we need to raise money for the government, and this is one way to do it. Uh, Jefferson actually accuses Hamilton of making the excise tax, knowing that uh, people out west and in the south would rebel, and then Hamilton would have an excuse to make the federal government that much more stronger to smash down the rebellions. But the fact of the matter is there is at least... Uh, some small-scale rebellions, and some historians say, you know, it's stretched to say rebellion, but there were people, and in this case, Western Pennsylvania, who had been using whiskey almost like to trade, to barter. Um, you know, you can take a wagon full of, uh, you know, wheat over the mountains, and it's not really worth your time. You're not getting a whole lot. But if you turn it into whiskey, you can take a wagon full of whiskey somewhere and, and make it more worth your time for profit. And so there's this uh, rebellion in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, Washington quickly assembles a rather large army, some people saying even up to 13,000 men. They go out west, and it is uh, basically, it quickly dissipates, and everyone goes back to business how it was, and it shows the strength of the federal government. Remember, um, prior to the U.S. Constitution, Shays' Rebellion, this a relatively small rebellion in Western Massachusetts, you know, showed such such weakness in the Articles of Confederation. Well, here you have a small rebellion, if you want to call it that, and it shows the strength of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, the Indian Intercourse Act of 1790, um, only the federal government can deal with tribes. This is actually oftentimes ignored back then, um, and people would make their own treaties and so forth, and it led to a lot of problems and battles between um, Native Americans in the U.S. Uh, Jay's Treaty. I mean, keep in mind, this, uh, you know, the French and the British are often at war during this era, and they they want to drag us into it. I mean, remember from the British point of view, we're we're one of them. You know, they created us. We we're one of their colonies, and we should owe them their loyalty, and we do a little more trade with them. Uh, the French, we, you know, they they're thinking, you know, we helped you Americans uh, win your American Revolution. You know, without our help at some of the battles, like Yorktown, you know, with the Navy and everything like that, and all the money we helped give you, uh, you wouldn't have won your revolution. You owe, you owe us, you know, a debt of gratitude, and you need to help us against our common enemy, the British. Um, and so, you have both sides kind of trying to drag us into the war. One of the famous uh, treaties here is uh, Jay's Treaty, uh, hammered out by John Jay. You might remember him for being one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. And uh, Jay, a Federalist here, uh, he goes and he hammers out this treaty, and all this treaty is highly controversial. Um, a lot of people think it favors Britain, but it keeps us out of war with Britain. Uh, there was a real fear and threat of us potentially going to war with Britain, and if we lost that war, a lot of people thought, well, you know, if, if we did go to war with Britain and lose, we very well could end up recolonized under Britain's thumb again. So it very well was probably the very smart move to avoid that war. Um, and J Jay's treaty keeps us out of war with Britain. Um, Pickney's Treaty. Now remember, back before highways, back before roads, we're a vast, we're a vast continent, and uh, you know uh, it's it's hard to move about. Rivers are one way of doing that. Now, 
we controlled out to the Mississippi River, in, uh, throughout much of the Mississippi River at the end of the American Revolution. You know, like Western Illinois boundary and, and so forth. We controlled out that far, but not past it. And we don't control, though, the mouth of the Mississippi River. And uh, that area kind of goes from French control to Spanish control to back to French control when uh, finally um, uh, Jefferson later buys it from uh, Napoleon, the French. But uh, Pinckney's Treaty gives us access to um, use the mouth of the Mississippi so that when we develop out west, remember it's more than just the Mississippi because the Mississippi River has countless rivers flowing into it. Um, namely the Ohio River being probably the biggest one, or at least the biggest one of that time period in terms of American use. But uh, Pinckney's Treaty guarantees that, you know, with Spain that we can use the mouth of the Mississippi River so we can develop, we can send uh, crops or whatever down the Mississippi River. And now, uh, George Washington's famous for his farewell address, you know, avoid big debt, try to avoid partisan politics. Although he tended to side with Federalists like Alexander Hamilton, uh, uh, George Washington wasn't a big fan of party politics. He was worried that uh, people would be more loyal to their party than their country and not do what's best for their country but what's best for their party. So he, he kind of warned us against that, warned us about getting too involved in foreign uh, messes and foreign wars overseas. And so that's his farewell address. We haven't really lived up to that very well. Uh, John Adams, real quick, a second president, vice president under George Washington, um, the XYZ affair. Um, basically, um, France, having been upset with us for not helping them against Britain, they had been stopping a lot of our boats and stealing cargo, stealing boats. And um, there's actually a, basically like a, like, a little, like a war breaks out, essentially an undeclared war breaks out on the, on the seas between um, France and America. John Adams is oftentimes considered the founder of the Navy because he grows our Navy uh, as a result of this. Um, and the XYZ affair happens, John Adams, um, send some diplomats to France to try to resolve this problem. And the French diplomats basically say, you know, um, we won't even listen to what you Americans have to say unless you A, give us each a bribe, and B, give France a loan in our war with Britain. Well, that could also upset Britain if we're giving them loans to fight Britain with. And so, uh, obviously, we reject that. Um, Americans are indignant that they ask for a loan and a bribe in order to even be listened to. And you get the saying, uh, you know, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. We we'll spend millions to build up our military, our navy, and arm, and build up our military strength, but we won't pay a penny to earn your respect. And the newspapers, when they report this, they remove the real French names with, and change it to X, Y, and Z to keep their anonymity. And that's what's called the X, Y, Z affair. Um, eventually, uh, John Adams is able to kind of re resolve this problem and resolve this conflict. But for a while, we're, we're actually fighting France and then basically a small undeclared war on the high seas. Uh, one of the most controversial things that John Adams does, and he actually does it reluctantly, as Federalist Party drags him into it, but the Alien and Sedition Acts. And this, this um, now, now the Federalist point of view is, look, the French and the Irish immigrants are trying to drag us into war with Britain. That could be very, very dangerous. So we need to limit their voting rights. Uh, that, you know, we can't let them vote immediately once upon moving here. We have to wait years to allow them to vote. Um, that's the alien part, and the president can deport dangerous aliens, dangerous immigrants from France and, and, and Ireland. Um, but the Sedition Act part, too. If you're criticizing the government, you can be potentially fined or imprisoned. And the Federalist government, the Federalist Party, says, look, we need these. It's dangerous. France is trying to get us into a war. Britain's trying to get us into a war. Um, you know, we're getting pulled at. We, we need to kind of, we need to strengthen up and we need to be able to stay out of this war for our own country's sake. But at the same time, the other party, the Jeffersonian Republicans, Jefferson, and people like Madison are also saying, Look, uh, they issue the, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. They're, just, they're saying, look, you know, you're not doing this to protect America. You're doing this to protect your own party. You're, you're trying to block the Irish and French from voting because they vote for us. You're trying to stop uh, people from criticizing the government because the Federalists control the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives at this time. Um, and we need freedom of speech. We need to be able to dissent. So, uh, uh, Jefferson and Madison through the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions say, you know, uh, uh, are in these two states, Kentucky and Virginia, that the Alien Sedition Acts, which are a series of acts, not just one law, but um, 
their void within their states. Remember, we're, we're figuring out how the Constitution exactly works. We don't have judicial review yet. Remember, Marbury v. Madison, that's what, 1803, so that's when Jefferson's president. So what happens is, uh, essentially, uh, this is up for debate in Jefferson and Madison are saying, well, our states have the right to nullify the law, to determine it's unconstitutional and therefore null and void within within a state. Uh, and that's a very interesting position, which we have since done away with. But at the time, a lot of smart individuals thought that might be real legal law. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, here is the Midnight Justices, which leads to that Marbury v. Madison case. Um, John Adams, maybe perhaps one of the best things he does as president, is nominate John Marshall, uh, a Federalist Supreme Court Justice, uh, the fourth Supreme Court Chief Justice that we've had, and arguably the best one that we've ever had. And John Marshall expands the federal government powers. I mean, if, if you get confused and forget an AP exam, what did the Supreme Court case do? If it's a John Marshall Supreme Court ruling, it's probably almost certainly in one shape or another expanding federal government power or limiting state government power. And um, John Adams, at the very, 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 very end of his presidency, the, um, you know, he serves one term, but the, the Federalists lose the White House. Jefferson beats Adams. And the Jefferson's party beats Adams' party in the, in the House of Representatives in the Senate. And the Federalists, on their way out the door, in their little lame duck session, uh, right after they've been voted out, but before they're actually out of power, uh, they create all these new sheriff and judge positions, and it goes to the mar it goes to the Supreme Court eventually. Jefferson's saying, "I don't have to uh, honor this." He's doing it at the last minute, and that goes to Marbury v. Madison, where John Marshall basically says that uh, the Supreme Court has this new power, judicial review, that the Supreme Court can determine whether the law is constitutional. And he tells Jefferson, he gives him kind of like a catch twenty two. He tells Jefferson. You have to see all these appointments because John Adams still technically was president, even though he was doing it at the last moment, the midnight before, you know, uh, at the stroke of midnight before he was um, done being president. And it was, was a House of Reps that approved of it, and it was a real U.S. Senate. But you have to allow all these people in, except for the fact that the original law was unconstitutional. So we have this new power called judicial review. So Jefferson's in this tough spot because either he has to allow all these appointees that he doesn't want in, or he has to do another thing he doesn't want, which is admit the Supreme Court, the federal government now has this greater power. But he gladly takes this new judicial review that John Marshall creates essentially, you could argue, out of thin air. Um, and so this is uh, the John Adams presidency in real brief, and of course the George Washington presidency.